in Jesus, it says, I'm safe evermore. And I want you to keep that in mind as we go to Genesis chapter 6. We'll start there. That's what I have up on the screen. Appreciate Michael being with us upstairs. John being... John. I don't know what he's doing here. But it's good to have, good to have company. Um, continue to pray again for um, our elders. Uh, during this time, we don't want them to get sick. Um, pray for our little babies, our young ones. We don't want them to get sick either. Uh, it's, a, it's a rough one. And uh, pray for our leaders. Uh, the governor of the state of Missouri has issued a stay-at-home order. It was just a recommendation. Now it's an order. And uh, I'm not sure to what extent uh, they will enforce that. Um, I haven't really looked into it. Uh, my wife had me painting. You know, I started out in life as a house painter. House painters will paint the whole world, but they don't want to paint their own house. I'm just saying that's how it is. So I was painting while uh, the governor was making his talk, so I don't know exactly uh, what was said there, but I think, it's, I think it's pretty serious. And so they're issuing, if you don't have to get out, they're telling you not to get out. And I did notice this morning, the streets were a lot quieter today than they have been. And what we're all wanting is for this thing to go away. And it will. I, I do believe that. I believe it will go away. Warm weather comes in, the solar radiation, um, they, viruses just don't handle the light. And I mentioned that last Sunday, and think about that, okay? Evil versus light, and evil doesn't do well in the light. And so you cannot comprehend it. So that's the way viruses are designed, is that solar re radiation kills them. Kills them fairly quickly. So that's why in warm weather, during the summertime, you don't have as much flu as you do during the wintertime. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying it's just, you just don't have as much during the summertime. So I do believe this will die down. And I believe people will go back to work. I think the restaurants will open back up. I'm happy that the bars are shut down. I am ecstatic that the bars are shut down. Um, and hopefully during this time, like I said this morning, people will take the opportunity to spread the word of God, sow the seed, sow the seed, and let people know that Jesus loves them, that Jesus died for them, and Jesus, uh, by his stripes, we are healed of the curse of sin. So take this opportunity to let people know that, all right? We're talking about preparation, and uh, now we're going to take it and we're going to talk about spiritual preparation. It's one thing if you build a bunker, and I want, there's a YouTube guy I watch. He builds bunkers all around the country. Um, he's the guy, and I can't remember his name, but he takes these big, what looks like culverts, big round things, puts them about 30, 40 feet underground, and by the time the dirt's packed in, it's almost like they're made of concrete. And he puts in all these air filtration systems in it. And that there's a little side room for a generator. It's got water tank. It's got septic system. It's got, I mean, it's got everything. And then underneath is storage for you to put all your food in and stuff like that. And some people are taking it to this extreme. They're getting in their bunker and they're holding out. It's one thing to prepare physically. It's another thing to prepare spiritually and to be prepared for days coming, and I hate to say this, days coming that could be worse 
than what they are now. Okay? But who do we have as our God? Who is our Savior? We sang that song, The Haven of Rest, and it ends with, In Jesus, I'm safe evermore. In Jesus. Now, I want you to focus on that, and I want you to think on these things, all right? Let's uh, read the scriptures. Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. God said, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. This is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. Now I want you to pay attention to the detail that God's giving Noah. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. That's sobering. And, and this whole thing that we're going through right now is sobering. It's meant to wake us up, I think, to get us to realize that there are enemies, some of them tiny little microscopic enemies to humanity. There are enemies to our country. I mentioned this this morning. There, it's possible. It is possible that those who hate America and that we have enemies foreign and we have enemies domestic. I absolutely believe that. That hate our constitution, that hate our Christian heritage, they hate all of that, and they would love to take advantage of a weakened nation to destroy it. No doubt in my mind about it. And I, again, I hate even saying those words. But if it happens, God brought it about. There is nothing outside of God's governance. Nothing is. He's in charge of everything. And if he's in charge of everything, if he saw this coming, which he did, then he has a way of escape for everybody. Don't fear. Don't fear. And I believe, I believe, you, you know my story, being electrocuted almost to death, some guy said I was struck by lightning, and we know who lightning is. Lightning is Satan. It was a guy on YouTube didn't like me. So he said I was struck by lightning. Lightning is Satan, so I'm full of Satan, obviously. Whatever. He got it wrong. I wasn't struck by lightning. I was electrocuted. And I thought I was going to die. And since that day, 14 years ago, I've prayed, God, when it's really time for me to die, I don't want to be afraid. So on days where I have fear and anxiety, I've had a little bit of that today. I know I wasn't going to die because I believe God will take that fear away from me when it's my time. I absolutely believe that. So God is going to do all of these things. But he said in verse 18, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come into thee to keep them alive. God brought these animals to Noah, I believe, according to the text. And take thee, take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. So it could be said that Noah was a prepper. But he was instructed by God to do it. And God had a plan, a way of escape, he had a savior in the form of a rectangular box. 
It's what it, it's what it amount to. 300 cubits, uh, 300 cubits long by 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. And if you remember, there was a, a test done years ago, a documentary about Noah's flood, and they built this box about that long, the ratio, they took the ratio and they brought it down and they put it in a wave tank where they test out the design of ships and stuff like that. And they said there's no way that thing would ever capsize, turn over upside down, nothing. The way it was designed, it was absolutely stable. God knows the laws of physics because he created them. And remember, I've said this for years, the very thing that, listen to this, the very thing that God used to destroy the sinners is what he used to save the righteous, those whom he had grace on. Okay, keep that in mind. Let's pray. Father, we ask for your grace the way you gave it to Noah. Father, we look for grace in your eyes. May we find it there. Have grace upon your people. Mercy. Father, we don't deserve your goodness. There's no way we deserve your goodness. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Father, by grace... You love us and you manifest that grace to us and you provide for us and you've done things for us, God, that we could not have done for ourselves. Father, truly the design of the ark was your idea and you gave it to Noah in no uncertain terms. He knew exactly what to do. And I believe, dear God, that as he was building that ark, you gave him wisdom as he put in every nail, secured every board, put in every window and every door, and Father, you led every animal to him so that he could save the seed of the animal kingdom, Lord, beyond the flood. And Father, you show us in that that you're a God who saves, a God who judges and will judge the wicked. But Father, with those upon whom your righteousness is on, you'll save them. And there's no way, Father, that we'll ever fall out of your grace. Father, just bless your word and open up our eyes and our hearts and give us comfort. And give us peace, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. Turn to Romans 8, if you would. Uh, Michael's going to put that up on the screen, but I want you to open your Bible to Romans 8 because the ark is a picture, of course, of Christ. And the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So think about that. There's Noah and his family, eight people on the ark. And the number eight is the number for new, be new beginnings, new life. So think about eight people on the ark. And in Genesis 8, they all leave the ark and walk off into a new world a world that God has cleansed, a world that God has purified with water. Okay, water is a cleansing agent in the Bible and in, and in life. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible says, there's, now, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, meaning our flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, and here it is again, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So going back to verse 1, there's no condemnation to us who are in Christ. So picture us being in the ark, inside of it. God shutting up the door of the ark. That's what we're going to find out later. God is the one who sealed Noah and his family and all those animals inside the ark. They were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Was it a little scary? Yeah. I can imagine as they're hearing the rains come down, the fountains of the great deep opening up, 
and that ark starting to lift up and the waves rolling and moving that ark around, I'm sure that probably wasn't fun. And for 40 days, the Bible says it rained and it rained day and night, but they were safe inside. God kept them. God is the one who prepared them for that time, and God is the one who kept them. So I want you to perceive now, and I want you to think this way. In fact, go to uh, Philippians, since we're dealing with uh, the number 8. 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, right after Ephesians. And I want you to look in chapter 4, verse 8. Imagine that. And I want you to count with me the things that are in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise. How many do we have, John? Eight. Eight. Think on these things. So, when you get scared, when you get discouraged, when you get frightened, when you get worried about, am I going to get my job back? Because people are losing their jobs. This is real now. This is a real thing. This is, this is a problem. People are losing their jobs. My son lost his job. There's people in this church that have lost their jobs. I've had to lay off the girls that work here to, just to keep, because you know we've had that in our church. So I want to keep everybody away from each other. It's a real serious issue. And it can, be, it can be overwhelming to us. If we sit and watch the news, if we sit and watch social media all day long and look at all the bad things that are happening. The Bible says that if you, whatever's true, that's the Bible. Whatever's honest, that's the Bible. What, whatever's just, that's the Bible. Whatever's pure, that's the Bible, the pure Word of God. Whatsoever things are lovely. This Bible is, the words are beautiful words. Whatsoever things are good report, this is the Bible. If there be any virtue, the Bible. If there be any praise, the Bible. Think on these things. So that's, that's why I came up with the expression, think Bible. Think Bible. In every situation, and in everything that happens in this world, seek the Lord. My favorite verse, Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. And again, there are things about what's going on in this world that I'm searching out that I want answers to. And I believe that God is faithful. I don't, I don't deserve the answers. But over the years that God has poured things into my heart and into my mind, into my soul, things that I've shared with everybody. I know God well enough to know that if God wants me to know and it, when it's time for me to know, God will open up my eyes, He'll open up my understanding, the Holy Ghost will speak Scripture and I'll go, that's it! And then I'll go, hey everybody, I got something exciting to share. And I'll tell everybody what it is, okay? So think along those lines. That's how we prepare for the days that we're in now. We've already prepared. God has already prepared you for the days that are here now. And maybe God is preparing you now for days that are coming ahead. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. That's what I have up on the screen as part of my notes. Look at, look at what God's Word says. Oh, I love this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Look at what it's saying. Our eyes have not seen the future. Our ears have not heard of what's going to happen. He has not entered into our heart the things that God has prepared. But does that mean that we can't know them? Look at the next verse. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. 
See, and it's his spirit. And this is where, this is where me and Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hindu and Rodney Howard Brown, who got arrested for having church, and all these other clowns part company. Because they say they get extra biblical revelations from God, things that are not in the scriptures. I don't buy that for a minute. I think if the Spirit's going to talk to you, the Spirit's going to quote scripture. And if you think, if you think you've heard from God, ask God to show you in this Bible whether you heard from God or not. God will show it to you. God will show it to you. So that's how we know. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things. Underline that phrase, all things. And then do a, do a Bible search on that. All things. Think of verses with that in it. All things. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. All right? So yea, the deep things of God. God can make... God can make even John understand the deep things. And I'm picking on John because he's the only one here. All right. So anyway, you don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to be Dr. So-and-so. All you have to do is be somebody that believes the Bible. And all of a sudden now you've got wisdom and you understand deep things that most people will never fathom in, this, in their life. Uh, verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. And the spirit of God is the word of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world. Did you check that out? You may have to get off social media. You may have to unplug from that. Because part of your problem is you're receiving things of the world that you don't know is true or not. You have no idea. You don't know if it's true or not. You, you don't. You believe it. But you don't know if it's true. But the Spirit, which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely Given to us of God. This is the verse that God dealt with me about to quit selling my videos. Years ago, I used to sell them. We used to go to churches. We used to sit at a table and used to put a price on them. And God dealt with me about selling them. Mike, what did I charge you to give you all that stuff? Uh, nothing. So why are you charging people to receive it? Quit selling it. So I did. And God's blessed us now because of that far more than... I mean, how in the world do we run two full-time FM radio stations? I have no idea other than God provides for it because the things that God has given me, He gave it to me freely. And He's given it to you freely. And he, He'll continue to do that. Um, Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words of which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's how you study the Bible. You read a little bit of, you read a little bit of uh, Genesis, then you read a little bit of 1 Corinthians, then you read a little bit of Psalms, then you read a little bit of the, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, then you read some Revelation, read some Daniel. You, go, you compare spiritual things here with spiritual things here. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Mm -mm. See, I, man, I've had 1 Peter in my heart all afternoon. Because you know what 1 Peter's about? I, 1 Peter has five chapters, and I think that's on purpose. Because think about what that number five represents. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. And I think 1 Peter can be summed up in 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. 
Now, again, I don't think this is the tribulation, but I think it is troubling. There's no doubt in my mind about it. So what if God was preparing us at this time for something far more serious? I mean, where did this virus come from? We don't know. Some say it came from the meat markets in China where they're serving bats. They eat bats. Ooh. Okay? And it jumped from bats to humans. Some say it's made in a lab. Okay? Who cares where it came from? It's here. Right? And it's troubling. What if it was worse than it is? What if it was like Ebola, where once you get it, there is no cure, and you literally bleed out in a matter of days? That happened, okay? It could be worse. And so I think 1 Peter is summed up in that verse, Beloved, think it not a strange thing concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Because he says over in chapter 1 that what he's writing about is verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, before, he says before Christ appears, our faith is going to be tried by fire and that is exactly what I believe I believe that as it was in the days of Noah right but God's promise that he's not gonna let it rain and destroy the world anymore so I believe he's gonna do it with fire and a fiery trial I believe is coming and we ought to be prepared for that here and here. So 1 Peter 3, verse 18 is what I have up on the screen. For Christ also hath once suffered for us, for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days, here's the phrase, days of Noah. What did Jesus say? As it was in the days of Noah. There's a connection with what Jesus said and this. The spirits that he's preaching to in prison. The Bible teaches us, Jesus said, as Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. We have a picture that we have this scripture, we have another scripture in 2 Peter, and then we have what Jesus said, and then we have, I believe, a, a, a typology of that in Genesis 40, where Joseph is in prison for a sin he did not commit, and he's preaching, prophesying to two people, the baker and the butler. Remember that story? And he prophesies to the butler that you're going to be lifted up out of this pit, out of the prison that you're in and you're going to be restored to Pharaoh's right hand you're going to squeeze the the cluster into into Pharaoh's cup and he's going to drink the baker however he prophesied condemnation to him and he says to him you're going to be lifted up in three days as well however you're going to be lifted up a little bit higher than the butler was because you're actually going to be lifted up hanging from a tree in three days. You're going to be killed. And that is exactly what happened to both. So to me, that's a picture of Christ preaching to spirits in prison. To those who are burning and tortured like the rich man, he's preaching condemnation to them. He's telling them, in three days, 3,000 years, you're going to be lifted out of here you're going to be judged. You're going to be cast in the lake of fire. But to the righteous in Abraham's bosom, like Lazarus was, I think he preaches that I'm going to set you free. You're going to be with me in paradise today. I'm going to lead you there. 
Okay? That's what I think happened. So look back at uh, verse 20. I have it underlined, while the ark was uh, preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. And again, the thing that God used to judge the earth was what God used to save the righteous. Now, I don't know exactly how that's going to work, but let's say that it is a trial by fire. What does fire do for us? It refines us. It tempers us. It purifies us, but it doesn't destroy us like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the Son of God in the fiery furnace. I think that's an example to us. Okay? So the like figure, now he's telling us that this is a, 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 a picture, a typology, a prophecy, the like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I think God right now in our lives, in every test, in every trial, in every trouble, in every mistake that we make, every sin that we commit, God says, I'm using that to teach you. I'm using that to teach you how not to do it the next time. How to fight it off the next time. I'm using these things to teach you and to prepare you for the days that are coming. Because all of us, whether we're living in the time of the translation, the rapture, or not, then we're going to live in a time where we're going to die. And are we prepared for that battle? Are we prepared for that day? And I think everything that happens to us God is either preparing us for the fiery trial which is to try us or is preparing us to defeat the last enemy that shall be destroyed which is death. Amen. Turn to 1 Corinthians 14. Mm -mm -mm. This Bible is rich and sweet. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 6. Now brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues... What shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation? Now I want you to underline this. Revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine. Notice, there, again, there's four things here. Revelation, knowledge, prophesying, doctrine. So we're not talking about physical preparation, where we're storing food, and we've we got water purifiers, and we got solar panels in case they shut the electricity off. And we've got a ham radio in case the internet goes down. We're not, we're not preparing that way, even though if you want to do that, that's fine. I recommend it. But also prepare by revelation. How do you get revelation? Read the Bible and ask God questions. Knowledge. How do you get knowledge? Read the Bible and ask God questions. Prophesying. That is telling others what God has shown you from His Word. Not from some wet, wacko website. From His Word. Share that. That's prophesying. Prophesying is what God said to Ezekiel. Son of man, prophesy unto these people. Prophesy and say unto them. That's what prophesying is. That's why women are allowed by Scripture, are given grace by the Holy Ghost... To prophesy. Your, young, your, uh, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall dream dreams. Your old men shall... I can't remember that. Anyway, you understand what I'm saying. God allows women to prophesy. What is prophesying? Sharing the word of God. Give people the word of God in these days. I can't stress that enough. Am I trying to jam that down your throat? Absolutely I am. So revelation, knowledge, prophesying, doctrine. Learn this Bible. Learn what it says. Learn what it means. When you hear stuff going on out in the world, and you hear conspiracy theories, check them against the Word of God. Ask, ask the Bible, is it in the Bible? Is what I've heard out here, is that in this book anywhere? I recommend wholeheartedly you do that. 
Uh, he says in verse 7, And even things without life, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, here's the word, prepare. Who shall prepare himself to the battle? Now think about it. Think about all the false. Let's go back to Y2K. Remember Y2K? Remember that, John? Y2K was a joke. And people made a huge deal out of Y2K. There were people who said that angels came and visited them and told them that Y2K was going to start the Great Tribulation. That was 20 years ago. It hasn't happened. I'm still waiting for it to happen. There are people who built bunkers and stored food in them preparing for Y2K. They would buy land out in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico and Nevada and Arizona, out in the middle of no place, spend millions of dollars, wasted. And people sounded the alarm on Y2K and nothing happened. So now, and people wrote books on this, made videos about it, and with those books and videos, made money. But it was all a lie. So, tell me then, how it benefits people. If everybody's sounding false alarms all the time. Y2K was supposed to bring in the New World Order. That didn't happen. The H1N1 virus was supposed to bring in the New World Order. That didn't happen. What other events have people blown a trump, an uncertain trumpet about that never took place? And I keep saying this. If you sound false alarms over and over and over again. At some point, people stop listening. Because every false alarm you said was going to bring in the end of the world, the new world order, it was going to bring in the tribulation, the rapture was going to happen, a peace agreement with Israel is going to be signed, and on and on and on and on. And it never happened. And people stopped preparing spiritually. They quit believing the Bible over stuff like that because hype was made. And now you've got people that don't want to hear it. Too many false alarms. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. And that's what's happening now. People are warning and making all these false claims or making claims. I don't know if they're true or false. Nobody does. But then nobody listens anymore. Nobody prepares. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Yeah. 2012. Remember 2012? 2012 was supposed to be, because that was on the Mayan calendar. And the Mayans knew something. No, they didn't. They were a bunch of sun-worshipping pagans who, were, who followed demons, devils, sacrificed unto devils. And people warned about 2012. Oh, 2012, there's going to be a paradigm shift. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing did except for the end of the X-Files series. 
1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they not be high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distrib di distribute, willing to communicate. Verse 19. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. This verse right here nails it. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. So, again, what does it profit? That you lay up in store food, shelter, electricity, and all sorts of things... But don't lay up in, because those things will rot. But when you lay up in store heavenly things, moth and rust cannot corrupt them. And what you're doing spiritually is you're laying up in store a spiritual foundation, spiritual stores, spiritual knowledge, spiritual understanding, spiritual wisdom... And then you're able to share that with people who will listen to you because your reasoning is sound because it's from the Word of God. And he tells, charge them that are rich in this world. I can tell you, I, listen, the, it's, there's been, I got dozens of stories stored in my Evernote of wealthy people buying up military silos. They're, they're converting them into underground bunkers luxury bunkers with everything that rich people deserve. And I just think it's going to be funny when God starts pouring out wrath on this earth and they're not able to get to the bunker. But he tells the rich people in this world, don't waste all your money on things of this world. Build you a foundation that will last forever. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Mm, mm, mm. Hebrews 11, verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath, what? Prepared for them a city. What did Jesus say? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So, we're going to lose this world and die out of it even if we prepare everything. So my point is this, if we're not prepared for the day of judgment that comes at the end of this life, what have we gained? So let's say you've got your bunker, you've got all your food, you can stay under there 10 years. You can extend your life 10 years. You're underground, I mean, I, I think you'd probably go crazy 10 years but let's say you do it and you come out you're still going to die still going to face God in judgment I personally believe that a plan is being worked on to get the elite off of this earth living in other places I believe that to avoid what's coming to this earth. But God said, I can point it out to you in at least three places in the Bible, God said, if you go up there, I'm going to bring you back down. He said in Amos 9, he said in Obadiah, Genesis 11 was about building a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Get, let's get off of this earth because God may judge us and it's not going to work. God's going to drag them back down. God had prepared for them a city. John 14, verse 1. 
Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. And then who was it? Thomas said, Lord, we don't know the way. Jesus said, yeah, you do. I, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So, build yourself up. Build up your faith, your trust, your confidence spiritually in this book. And when you have doubts, go to the book and read it until you don't have doubts anymore. John, does it work? It does. I'm telling you it does. Luke 12. Look what, he, look what our Savior said. Luke 12, 23. The life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. It's funny to me that in a national disaster in a city where there's rioting taking place and people are being killed, that people will go in and they loot stores and they steal televisions and wigs. How is that going to keep you alive? That makes sense. Life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens. For they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? Careth God for ravens? Does God care for squirrels? I was watching squirrels this afternoon out in the yard. Mouth just plumb full of... God keeps them alive. God keeps all the birds alive. He keeps all the fish alive. He feeds them every day. Who are we compared to them in God's eyes? We were the special creation of God. You think God cares about oxes and whales and everything else? I mean, God, sure, there was dinosaurs on the earth. God let them die off. Man didn't do that. God did. God cares about us. And he cares enough about us to take us through times to show us how to live through hard times. Because hard times come. In every generation they come. That's it. I'm done. Worked out. It's just right after 3 o'clock. I timed it almost perfectly. If we hadn't sung that last song, we would have quit right at 3. It was a good song. But consider that. You know, God, uh, Paul talked about, uh, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And what he's saying on that, he's, he's talking about the provision for those who labor in the word of God. In other words, you've got an ox and he's strapped to a mill grinding corn. Grinding kernels of wheat and corn and barley and things like that. Okay, that's how they did it. Shouldn't the ox get fed from some of that? That was the point. And that's what he said. Careth God for oxen? You think God cares about that ox? No. He lets lions eat them. <laughs> okay? What he cares about is us. And he uses that as an illustration. If the ox gets to eat a portion of the grain that's come in from the harvest because his strength is being used to move that big giant stone mill to mill out all that corn into flour and meal, then God cares for those who labor in his word who put their trust in him. God cares about them. And the same word that they then distribute out to people, God provides for them as well. God's taken very good care of me and my wife and our family. 
He's paid our bills. Sometimes we didn't know where money was going to come from. We'd get a big bill in, all of a sudden, boom, there'd be money to pay for it. I had no idea where that came from. That's just how God does it. I think maybe, maybe God is putting us in a time where we're going to have to trust Him. Every day we're going to have to trust Him. Like Noah did. Noah didn't quit. and We can't afford to. Father, what great lessons there are in this book. I love this book. I love the lessons. I love the testimonies. I love the stories that it tells. It tells about people who are just like me. Who made it. People that survived. People that died, then were glorified. People who are in heaven now, where we're going to be one of these days. Father, I love this book. And I pray, dear God, that you have sufficiently prepared your people for the times that we're living in right now. Father, give us understanding for just this one day, just this one day today. And then tomorrow when we get up, give us understanding and help and comfort for that day alone. So that, Father, we are like the prayer that Jesus prayed. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So, Father, help us. Give us comfort. Give those who are afraid grace and mercy. Show them your love. Help them, dear God, to feel your presence with them. And let them know, God, that they're not alone and they've never been alone. Father, I'm thinking of all the dear, sweet elders in our church. The ladies, the men. I love them so much. I pray, God, that you would provide for them great comfort in these days. Let them know, God, that you've been with them. You've never left them. And your spirit lives inside of them while they live inside of Christ. And Father, just bless them and bless us all. Prepare us for even harder times to come. Because we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. But we trust you. Thank you, God, for leading us. We love you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.